Thanks for watching Henry AI Labs. This tutorial is going to show you how to build an image classifier to parse out video data, particularly to crop out dunks from a full workout tape. This tutorial is powered by the NVIDIA Data Science PC built by DigitalStorm. This PC has two Titan RTX GPUs in it that we're going to use with the TensorFlow 2.0 distributed training API to scale up training to the two GPUs and train our image classifier to crop out dunks. I think recording your workouts is a great way to stay motivated and to document your progress and overall just make working out more fun. So in this example, I'm recording my dunk workouts where I put my iPhone on a tripod, set it at about the three point line, and then I just record as I dunk. So the output of these sessions are I get about uh, eight to 10 of these uh, uncut videos of about uh, one to two minutes where most of the video is just nonsense. And uh, ideally I just wanna see the dunks. So for example, going from this entire clip just to the four dunks that are contained in the video clip. The first piece of code we'll look at is how you go from a uh, movie file, like a dot .movie file, and extract the video frames using OpenCV2. So I'm storing each of the dunk sessions as individual video clips in the raw underscore. And then so in order to test generalization, I'm going to be wearing two different shirts in the dunk sessions, a black shirt and a blue shirt. So I have my blue shirt clips and then I have my black shirt dunk clips. So now going into OpenCV2, I'm going to open up the uh, folder, uh, navigate to this directory, the raw black shirt, and then I manually put in the clip. This probably isn't the best way of doing it, but it's just how I did it for the sake of this. So then I found that when I read the frame, for some reason it's rotated 90 degrees. So I use this image utils library to rotate it back upwards. And then I just use the I am right function, make sure I'm incrementing the counter so I'm not just writing over the same frame over and over again. And then I use this to write this into this directory, which is gonna be the black shirt clip eight uh, folder. So once I've written the video frames to the folders, this is my strategy for uh, labeling the data. So basically I have a binary classification problem where I'm either in the frame or I'm out of the frame. And so what I wanna do is I wanna classify the frames where I'm in the frame and then use that to cut out the dunk clips and then avoid all the empty frame nonsense in the uncut video. So what I did is I go through this, uh, the segment of clips and I kind of scroll ahead to find where I first appear in the clip. And then, okay, so something like this. So already one interesting characteristic of this problem is that there's a lot of borderline cases. Like in these frames, I'm like kind of in the frame, not really in the frame. So maybe I would even improve the classification on this if I added a third uh, class to the problem where it's like, you know, borderline cases to so the classifier can have some more uncertainty and not be uh, overly criticized for it. So it actually is remarkable that in the end, the classifier gets like 100% accuracy when it's got these kind of noisy frames in the data set. So what I would do is I would go to where I first appear, I'd scroll up, click this, and then I would drag it into the black shirt empty folder. And then I would, you know, move that to the trash and then I would go and get the in-frame folder and I would repeat this up to the clip. So data labeling can be a bit tedious, but you know, once you start to have a sizable data set, you can, and you have this kind of uh, natural data where it's sort of like contiguously labeled. Like for example, uh, if frame 405 is out of frame, frames 404, 403, et cetera, they're probably out of the frame too. So what I can do in the future is I can uh, use the train classifier to help me label the data because it'll be really obvious where the classifier has made mistakes due to this contiguous nature of the natural data. So for this project, I've been uh, getting the movie files, extracting the frames and labeling the data on my laptop. And now I wanna transfer it over to the NVIDIA Data Science workstation. So before I transfer this data, I'm gonna resize it down to the 224 by 224 resolution. Because in this example, I'm going to be using the pre-trained ResNet 50 from the Keras applications, and it takes as input 224 by 224, and I found a good enough result with that that I don't think there's any need to, say, implement a customized ResNet that could take in a higher uh, input resolution. So this code, all it does is it uses the Pillow library. I personally prefer using Pillow to OpenCV2 when I, you know, when I can. So I open the, uh, you know, you, you loop through the path in the directory, you open it using this kind of syntax, then you use the resize function, the nearest interpolation from the pillow library. Uh, you got to convert it to an array. I probably could have just wrapped the NumPy array in this if I wanted it to be more concise, but you know this code is kind of hacky and not really super uh, cleaned up. So then I use the image IO library to write it to the new directory, the 224 data set, and then I increment the count so I'm not writing over the same image over and over again. So the 224 data set, you can see an individual image is, uh, is about eight kilobytes compared to if I had the uh, the full data set, I'd be trying to transfer about 364 kilobytes per image. So we see already a massive reduction in the memory size, because as I mentioned, if you follow me on Twitter, I'm gonna transfer this with a flash drive, so I definitely wanna cut, as, cut away as much memory as possible before I, uh, 
transfer the data. So also thank you for all the recommendations. I had a look at DVC for uh, data version control and uh, having you know a system for sharing these data sets between machines. Definitely really interesting stuff to look into in the future. So now we've taken the data from the laptop on the flash drive and ported it over to the NVIDIA Data Science Workstation. And we're gonna use the TensorFlow 2.0 distributed training API to train this classifier. So the first line of this code is to import warnings and filter the warnings to ignore them. If you use TensorFlow before, you know it gives you a lot of warnings and I, you can get around some of them with this uh, little technique. So I've noticed in TensorFlow 2.0, you need to put uh, TensorFlow before Keras when you're importing it. I haven't looked into it too much and I don't really think it's that irritating, so I've just kept doing it. So originally I tried with the image data generator, but right now the uh, Keras image data generator, the fit generator function isn't supported with the distributed training API. But luckily in this case, we don't really need to do too much of this online data augmentation because, you know, sometimes it's interesting, generalization is obviously important, but in my case, I'm trying to clip these, uh, the distribution between my training and testing is, is really none, no, like nothing at all, maybe like a backpack with a basketball in the corner of the frame. So I'm not, and I don't even think data augmentation would get me around that anyways. So I don't use uh, data augmentation in this example. So then I uh, messed around with some of these callbacks, the reduced learning rate on plateau, CSV logger, and early stopping, but I didn't really end up using them. Uh, so import the model, obviously, uh, use a global average pooling to catch the uh, output of the ResNet 50 and then filter it into our new dense layers. And then here we go, we're importing the ResNet 50 from the Keras applications. So first what I did is load the memory, uh, load the data into memory using the pillow library. So I set this list, training X, training Y, uh, for the path in the directory, it just open it, you know, convert it to a NumPy array, and then import that one class label to the Y labels. And then do this, but, you know, appending zero to the uh, empty uh, data set, to so filling up our training and our, uh, our, our images and then our labels. So then we go through our training data, uh, we wrap it into NumPy arrays, convert it to Flow32s, and then we normalize it by dividing it by the max value, which in this case is the 255 pixel value. And then we convert our labels into NumPy arrays as well. So now we import our SGD optimizer, and this is the part where we're starting to use the new TensorFlow 2.0 distributed training API. So I kind of just copied this from the, um, the documentation if you go to TensorFlow 2.0 distributed training API. So what you do is you uh, import the distributed strategy, the mirrored strategy is the only one I think is actually implemented. So then you pass it in the number of devices. In the case of the NVIDIA Data Science Workstation, we have two GPUs, which is really awesome. Then we uh, pass it a batch size of 64 to each of the devices, and now we're ready to get started. So, uh, oh, we actually don't need to define the step size in the syntax, but. So we define the strategy.scope using this uh, up top. Uh, we define our model within this code. And then, so basically what we do is we take our ResNet 50, then we, uh, you get like the output of it like this. You take off the uh, last fully connected classification layer because you know, you're importing this uh, previous train model on ImageNet classification. So it's got this uh, dense uh, fully connected layer at the top, which is trying to do a thousand way image classification, but we want to modify that to do binary classification. So we're going to do the global average pooling. Uh, we're going to pass it through two uh, dense layers, completely arbitrarily chosen. I don't even know if you need this or not, probably not. Then we're going to pass it through the uh, one node uh, activation. So a funny thing is I originally wasn't getting this to work because I accidentally put softmax because I'm used to doing that with the categorical cross entropy. But when you're doing the binary cross entropy, make sure you have a sigmoid or some other thing on the uh, activation of this last layer. So then we're just going to compile our model together by having the inputs is the base model dot input. And then the outputs is this prediction layer. So this syntax of passing in the previous layer is called the functional API in Keras. So then we are going to define our optimizer and then compile the model. And then it'll give you all these warnings that the import warnings, warnings filter wasn't able to ignore. In order to use the uh, TensorFlow distributed training API, we need to convert it to this tensorflow.data object. So I kind of just copied this exactly from the documentation. I'm not completely sure. I mean, I think that doing the cache and then shuffling it and then having this batching is, you know, sort of putting the data onto the GPU and, you know, some kind of instructions within that that I'm not completely 100% uh, knowledgeable of. So the, you would, might want to load the weights to do the training, but I decided to just train from scratch, so I commented this out. So then you just uh, train the distributed training API. This is probably my favorite part about distributed training API. We've got the NVIDIA Data Science Workstation with two GPUs on it. In order to scale up to distributed training, it's the same syntax as it's always been, just model.fit, train data epochs. The previous code that we've seen to make it adaptable to distributed training API, really hardly any work at all. So we see with the two GPUs, the first epoch takes 93 seconds, and then the second and third, 63, 65. And this is about 2.5 times faster than doing it the original way, which we're gonna look at next. So after we train the model for 100 epochs, we're gonna save the weights, and then we will 
um, move the weights back over to the laptop for inference and for trimming the videos. To further encourage the distributed training uh, to TensorFlow 2.0 API and the NVIDIA Data Science Workstation, we'll look at the contrary speed if you use just one GPU training this. So we see 154 seconds on the first epoch compared to 93, and then 143, 144 compared to 63 and 65. So we can already see how we're able to use larger batch sizes when you know we're putting the 64 batch size on each of the GPUs, and then we can see how we're getting a much faster training. So really interesting, this combination of the TensorFlow 2.0 distributed training API, making it so easy syntact uh, syntactically to scale up your training to two GPUs, and then the built-in setup of the NVIDIA Data Science Workstation. So now that we have the weights that were trained on the NVIDIA Data Science Workstation, we're back on the laptop and we're going to load them in uh, into the memory. So the way that we do this is we have to uh, import the ResNet50, the dense and global average pooling layers, and the model. So we redefine the model again. We don't have to do it within the strategy.scope because we're not doing distributed training. And then we load the weights into this model. So now we're going to get into how we use the model to parse the uh, raw video data in order to crop out the frames that actually have uh, me in the frame and actually have the dunks. Well, this definitely isn't the cleanest code, you know, most beautiful to look at, but I'll explain it, uh, every line of it, and I'm pretty sure it'll be clear how it works. So we get the CV2, the image utils, as we uh, mentioned earlier, to rotate the images back upright from how the uh, video capture in CV2 reads the image. Uh, we got our pillow library, NumPy, and time, just because we want to time how long this is going to take, just for the sake of understanding it. So then we're going to open up our clip that we want to get the dunks out of. Uh, we're going to use the successes just to see if the... Uh, you know, if you've, if you've reached the end of the video. And then we're gonna use this frame counter in order to uh, uh, label the images within our action frames. And we'll, we'll get into, in the next uh, line of code, we're gonna look at why we use this action frames in order to, uh, you know, clip the videos according to the binary classification labels. So we start the timer, uh, we open up the uh, video stream. So this is just a check at the end to avoid the error where if you, uh, Success will kind of, it'll read this frame and then it won't be uh, zero until it gets to the top of the loop. So it'll throw an error if you try to like, uh, you know, rotate this image because it's a none type, not an image. But anyways, so we rotate the image upwards, then we uh, convert it to the pillow image. We use the pillow image to resize it because remember our classifier takes in 224 by 224 as input. Uh, we convert this to a NumPy array. Again, I probably could have wrapped this in NumPy array, but, we'll, and this as well. I could have put dot as type at the end of it, but it doesn't matter. So then we're going to normalize it as the normalized divided by 255 is what our classifier is used to. So then this is an interesting line of code that you might forget when you first start uh, building image classifiers is that when you're doing inference, you need to pass it in. You can't just pass it in as the 224 by 224 by three, you know, image uh, array tensor, whatever you want to call it. You have to put that original. So it's like one 224, 224, three, because this is what your classifier is used to taking. Your classifier is used to taking in as input batch size, height, width, channel. So you need to put just the one for the batch size. So then we're gonna use the model.predict for our label. And so, as I mentioned earlier, there are a lot of these boundary cases where you're like kinda in the frame, not really. So we're setting a pretty high decision threshold. So only if the label is higher than 0 0.95 do we count this as being in the frame and append it to our action frames list. And then we'll increment the frame counter. So this section may be where it gets a little confusing. So with the action frames, basically what we have is we have the uh, locations in the frames where you're in the frame, so where the classifier is predicted one. So this is gonna be a list of numbers, say uh, frame 405, 406, 407, up to 587, and then the next number might be 785, 786, say up to 906, and then, you know, like 1,120, a list like this. So what this code is doing is it's looping through the list and it's coupling them together like this because from frame 405 to frame 577 is a dunk. From, same 70s, uh, from frame 792 to 906 is a dunk, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So what this code does is it just loops through the action frames and it checks for this kind of gap between 577 to 792. And then it checks whether it's a like an upper bound or a lower bound on the uh, clip so that it can kind of group them this way. So I know it's definitely not the prettiest code to look at, but this is what it's doing. It's looping through this list of the one labels and then it's grouping them together into the clips that uh, you know look like this. So this is saying this frame 1,517 1, uh, up to frames uh, 1,724 is a dunk clip. So now that we have our array that tells us where the dunk clips are, we're going to loop back through the uh, video clip and then we're going to use the uh, lower bound and the upper bound to uh, write the, uh, the clips in the video to a separate folder, which we're then going to batch together using the uh, CV2 video writer next. So what we do is we first check if we're at the lower bound, 
And if so, we're going to make this directory where we're going to put the clips. And then we, you know, as we continue to loop, we'll see if we're in between the uh, lower bound and upper bound, you know, rotate it upwards again, kind of silly thing that you have to do. And then we'll write it to the, uh, the folder, making sure that we have this uh, counter, which we're using to increment, make sure we're not writing over the same frame over and over again. And then again, we're incrementing the clip. So each clip will be like clip one, clip two, clip three, or you can name it dunk one, dunk two to make it less confusing. But so then once the counter exceeds the upper bound, what we're going to do is we're going to pop it off of the dunk list. So using the syntax dunks.pop at index zero compared to pop, if you just do uh, dunks.pop, it'll pop it off of the end of the list and you want to take it from the front of the list so that you can continue in the syntax. So say you get to 578, you would pop this off and then uh, the frame counter is at uh, 579 or whatever, and then it will go until it hits uh, 792 and then do the same thing again. So the code we just looked at writes these uh, image frames into these clip folders. So now we're going to look at some code that I found, and I will provide a link in the description to the code that I uh, grabbed from this. The only thing is I had to mess around a little bit with this because uh, it's like kind of dependent on your operating system, I think. So using the Mac operating system, this is just what worked for me, and I basically just tried a bunch of things randomly until this worked. So what we're going to do is first we're going to have the uh, 30 frames per second. If you want to have it slow motion, you would do, say, 15. And if you want to have it fast, you could do 45. I don't know why you would want to do that for this case. but So 30 is kind of like normal speed. So what we do is we take the clip folders and then we turn them into movies in the uh, dunks directory. So we see that from the clips, we can now uh, look at the individual dunks videos that it's made by parsing through the uh, clips, kind of stacking them together into a video. In the future, I'd really like to get this onto the mobile phone, uh, check out things like how we can accelerate inference. So on one of the uh, trials, I had a, uh, using the timer, the start equals time dot time and then end equals time dot time, I was timing how long it was taking the model to do inference, and it was taking about 0.1 seconds. So I'd really like in the future to experiment with how to speed up that inference, how to get this onto a mobile phone, and then all the challenges that come with that. And also I think it would be interesting just to test how this generalizes, especially with other dunkers and you know different uh, kinds of uh, gyms. So say like in a park or just you know any indoor gym, I'm sure would throw this off because just the challenge that achieving uh, great generalization can be. So thanks for watching this end-to-end -end tutorial, how to get the video frames, extract them, uh, train an image classifier using the really exciting TensorFlow 2.0 distributed training API and the NVIDIA Data Science Workstation with two GPUs to really accelerate this training, and then how to use this model in order to uh, uh, clip out video frames and you know apply it to some kind of application. I hope this maybe inspired your own applications and your own ideas for how you can use computer vision. Thanks for watching, and please subscribe to Henry AI Labs for more deep learning and AI videos.